on this episode of Edge of the Web. If you do not have the expertise to talk about this, then you're probably not going to rank well. And that's a that's a really big change for SEOs um, because now I you can't come to me with a you know a mediocre website and pay me tons of money to rank it well if you don't have EAT it's just not going to happen. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of best podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. Well, thanks for joining Edge of the Web. Uh, we certainly appreciate all of our audio listeners, especially uh, we want to let you know that we're streaming on Facebook and Twitter on a regular basis every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So we certainly would love for you to join our live session, ask questions of our guests, and uh, have some have some interaction. Because you know, we certainly uh, are, are listening regularly, and we would love you to for you to contribute into the show regularly. Uh, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios, uh, located in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, every every week, we're bringing you uh, digital marketing news, the cutting edge uh, industry knowledge, and marketing influencers from around the planet. So we're blessed to be able to have this type of connection to organizations and individuals that that are really leading the the charge and understanding the digital marketing space that we that we continually see growth and uh, expansion in. Uh, check out all the recent shows over at Edge of the Web Radio com. You can see all the uh, all the articles. The interview articles, all the show posting, the links from each and every show. Uh, check out all that. Uh, the, the show itself is actually sponsored by Site Strategics, our parent company. And we are the uh, uh, practitioners of the agile digital marketing method. So if you want to see uh, results-based uh, marketing execution and flexible uh, changing tactics, come on over to sitestrategics.com. That's S-I-T-E strategics.com. Uh, give us a jingle at, uh, I did say jingle, at 877-SEO for web or 877-736-7932. Or just, uh, hey, uh, connect with us online and we'd be happy to have an hour uh, just talking about your digital marketing su success and possibly give you some some good tips to, to apply f to your website or your marketing right then and there. So jump on over there. My name is Aaron Sparks. I'm the C CEO and owner of Site Strategics and Edge Media Studios. Um, the reason we talk about this on a regular basis, Tom, I'm going to introduce you uh, to Tom, uh, our audience here. Tom Broadbeck, he's the director of digital media. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm going to jumble things up here for a second. Why do we do this show, Tom? Aaron, every time you throw this to me, yep. I tell you we do it mm -hmm. for the money. For the money. So, so, so we're getting paid to we're, do this show. We're flush with cash, John <laughs> Ralphio would say. <laughs> you get a show, you get a show. Yeah, um, that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, we certainly, uh, we, we, we would love a sponsorship. So, so come on board because we are actually uh, looking for our next new sponsor. Right, uh, yeah. but um, you know, we we anyway we we can talk about that later. One of the reasons that we do do the show is is to focus on on kind of like unpacking and explaining uh, digital marketing con concepts. There's so many different tactics. There's so many different lanes. So mm -hmm. many areas, right? Yeah. To be able to execute, um, you know, more importantly. We want to be able to explain to ourselves. So we learn sure. uh, from this show on a regular basis. Yeah. So Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talk to great people every week, so it's great to have people on the show. We have Marie mm -hmm. on with us today, and so great, great some insights for her. But we got the news. It's an educational resource for our team here, so, so lots of reasons why we do the show. All the reasons. All the reasons, plus John Ralphio's were flush with cash. <laughs> I'm just eagerly waiting what puns they're going to do today since today is Valentine's as we're recording it. Right. If it's going to be Valentine's Day puns or since it's episode 302, how many redirect jokes you're going to make? Well, I mean, I was actually going to suggest. Temporary redirect jokes. Exactly. I was temporarily going to ask you to go over to social media okay. world and be able to download their podcast. No, 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 no. You want to make sure that you stay here. So that's a temporary redirect. Thank you for teeing that up for me. I'm just waiting for them to come. I know. See, see I was tormenting you with that because I didn't lead with that particular introduction, <laughs> right? I was redirecting the the, the frustration yeah. over the over to your side of the fence. I'll just temporarily pretend like I <laughs> enjoy the <laughs> jokes. You didn't like the three hundred ones. You had no idea where that was coming from. <laughs> I just didn't know where you're going with it. <laughs> well, we were. Let's redirect okay. you to our host <laughs> or to our guest right now, Marie Haynes. How are you doing today? 
Hey, I'm well, guys. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. Now you get the the inside SEO jokes, right? I do. Actually, it's kind of funny because our office in the building that we're in, the first room we were in was office number 404. Nice. And I joked <laughs> nobody would be able to find us. Um, and so we moved down to the third floor and I desperately wanted 302 because I know we're going to be expanding out of here, but we got room 300. See, still, so that's what I'm talking about right there. <laughs> So we're probably not even going to be doing show 404 just for that particular purpose. The, the we'll show just, that will not we'll be just seen. We'll skip it. We'll just skip it. It's kind of like... Uh, floor 13. Yeah, 13 exactly. Floor. Did, you, did you know uh, in Japan they actually skipped the fourth floor? Did you know that? I did not. I, I just found that out for my son. Way to go. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. Because, well, I mean, honestly, they do that because <coughs> the, the, how they print... <laughs> they produce... <coughs> because how you pronounce four in... in oh, boy, I'm getting myself really stretched out here. So we're going to actually just move on. Uh, Marie, every show we go after the latest trending topics and today's digital marketing news. Uh, you ready to dive in there? For sure. Definitely. All right. So let's take you through again, the latest digital marketing news. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. So with this week's trending topics, we're right at the top of the list here from Moz, uh, a new domain authority is coming out soon. Uh, this is from Russ Jones. What's changing when and why? So Tom, tee us up with what domain authority is first for our users that don't know what that is. So domain authority is a ranking, not ranking factor. It is not a ranking factor. It is a tool that Google, that uh, the SEO Moz or Moz used to create mm -hmm. that was similar to Google's page rank, which is... Google uses as a ranking factor. So yep. it's just a way to grade your website versus another website. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the data that uh, that Moz was using to create the original domain authority uh, number, they are changing a lot of that back machine learning type of hmm. stuff behind the scenes type of thing that's cool. to uh, more reflect the current state of, of Google. And that's a zero to 100 scale. Yeah, it's that's on a zero to 100 scale. So right. essentially the higher number, closer to 100 you have for your domain, mm -hmm. the chances are that you will rank better within a certain search result for your website. Right. right. It's a predictor of how well. Yes. Oh, well, sorry about that. My Lord. Mute the phone. Yeah, I'm saying. Uh, it's a predictor <laughs> <laughs> on uh, how well uh, any keyword will rank in the top 10 for your domain authority. Is that is that the factor? Uh, it's not, just ne not, not necessarily a top okay. 10. It's just uh, just a grade for your domain. Roger. So like uh, Amazon.com or Fox News or CNN. Those will be in the 90s. In the 90s and the 100s. Right. Google, guess what, is at 100. Right? Sure. Um, and so at the at the bottom of the list, if you're trying to rank and you got a zero authority, well, there's a number of things that you got to do to yeah. start bolstering that up. So yeah, so, so, yeah, so the, the, they're, they're preempting. It's coming out March 5th, if I remember. Mm -hmm. I scroll down to the bottom because that's where I remember seeing it. Yeah, March 5th, they're releasing the new update. So people's, if, if you use that as a communication tool for your clients, mm. uh, you could see that number go up significantly. You could see it go down significantly just because that grading scale has changed uh, within the back end of Moz. So um, I, I wanted to ask Marie, I don't mm -hmm. know if they, she has more information than I do about this, of how frequently did the old domain authority update? Because um, I don't feel like I really saw much fluctuations no matter how much work we did right. within the domain authority. So I wasn't sure how much that was it just whenever they updated the the Open Site Explorer data or, or how how. If you know, I don't know if you know or sure. not. I don't know exactly, but I know that it used to update fairly frequently. Okay. And um, what Moz would always say, if your domain authority went, say it went down, and then the Moz forums would be filled with people saying, like, why did my domain authority go down? Right. It's important to know that it's it's in comparison to the rest of the sites in your, your niche, right? So you could have done nothing wrong, and then another site managed to get a bunch of good links and um, yeah. you know, improve their authority. And, and so people get really confused because it's not, it's, it's a metric that Moz has made in order to try to estimate page rank. Yep. Um, but the problem is, I, I mean, page rank algorithm has expanded dramatically since it first came out mm -hmm. and uh, DA is not going to be exactly the same as um, what page rank is. So, I mean, Moz has been, they haven't really told us what all of their new factors are, which makes sense. It's probably proprietary. Um, and so we we look at DA, but we don't put a whole lot of stake yeah. in it, if that makes sense. Yeah, just more of a research tool, I guess, is mm -hmm. what, what I really use it for. 
Uh, yeah, I, and is it? I, I I think one of the largest factors that we've seen was just the the authority of other domains are the bootstrap factors by and large for authority gaining on any given given domain. There's a lot of internal factors, but but. Uh, the Moz Authority really took hold whenever uh, when when Penguin came through and we had to clean out uh, what not we didn't but <laughs> Link Farms were were were, were killed off <laughs> and uh, you had to really kind of look at your authority in a whole nother light and and what those genuine domains were that were linking to the sites right yes and no mm. and see that's where I took some issue with uh, I mean don't get me wrong I'm a massive fan of Moz and I and I we do use domain authority in some of our assessments but um, what I was seeing when I was doing link audits is people were saying well this can't be a bad link because it's from a high domain authority site right um, you could you could manufacture that you know you can build a PBN uh, that has a, a high domain authority on their sites and mm. Um, you know, so I think it's something that you can use in conjunction with other tools. Uh, and I think where it got really popular was when Google took away the toolbar page rank, if you remember yeah. that to have that tool, right? And I think Google took that away because now they can get information from Chrome. You know, I, I think before we were feeding them all this information about the websites that we visited when we were using the toolbar. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when we didn't have that, how are we supposed to easily say, well, you know, this is a good site to get a link from uh, if we were mostly thinking of link authority? Um, and so one of the issues I have now is that there's so much more in Google's algorithms than just the authority of links. Uh, and I mean, you know, we'll talk about quality raters and, and stuff like mm -hmm, that. But mm -hmm. uh, so it's very, it's very hard to uh, yeah. try to reverse engineer what Google's doing. Yeah. Yep. And Moz isn't the only one that has a domain authority, right? The HRS has right. their own version. Right. Uh, Majestic, uh, Ma has, Majestic has one. I don't know if SEM Russia. Yep, they do. do they have one? Yep. Yeah, Cognitive so, has their own. I mean, yeah, yeah, so it, it's just, just Moz's version. They're, they're updating. It's been, I don't know if it was the first one, but it's one that's most widely adopted. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. But I mean, all things being equal, everybody should be paying attention to something of an evaluation uh, mm -hmm. tool, right? To be able to just gauge, you know, things and factors that uh, you probably should pay attention to. And if you got a weak spot, you have to have that type of mirror. Um, over at TechCrunch from Ingrid London, LinkedIn. Dun, 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 I wish I had some trumpets at my disposal right now. Uh, LinkedIn debuts LinkedIn Live, a, a new live video broadcast service. <coughs> Pardon. This is really what I've been waiting for because we wanted to get edge into the the LinkedIn community. Uh, the social network for working uh, the working world will close will be close to six hundred million users globally. They say that the video is the fastest growing format on its platform alongside original wit written work. Now it's actually taking a step in uh, in in the medium uh, right now. This week, uh, the company is launching the live video, giving people and organi organizations the ability to broadcast real time video to select groups or to the LinkedIn world at large. So they're launching a beta. Uh, first in the U.S., uh, LinkedIn Live, as the product is called, will be invite only in the coming, coming weeks. LinkedIn will also post a contact form for others who want to get in on the action. It's not clear when and if LinkedIn will make it possible for everyone to be able to create LinkedIn Live videos. But if you consider how, you know, how it's developed, publishing features for the written work, that will come very soon later. So... That's interesting from, uh, forgive me, like shows like this where we can actually do this type of broadcast, but you also have seen th such a pervasive use of uh, videos inside of LinkedIn. Yeah. I mean, literally everybody is doing some sort of so, some sort of uh, video cameo mm -hmm. shot, and it's getting pretty cluttered in there. It is. And unfortunately, this is, if this is open to the wide public, right, it's just going to be even more cluttered with live streaming videos all over the place. I mean, if people watch it, I mean, I don't see any reason why LinkedIn would get away from it. Right. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm sick and tired of watching people doing the selfie walk <laughs> down the street while they're doing some insight for a two-minute video. Yep. Like, like that concept's old. So, I, I mean, give people more tools and see how they can be creative with it and yep. see what comes up. And the best, the cream will rise to the, to the top, right? Absolutely. Very similar to uh, maybe a Valentine's Day gift that you're having today, right? So this is LinkedIn's Valentine's Day gift to everybody here. As long as it's either Reese's or Oreos, I'm down for it. Ooh, so. see, 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 there you go. That's all right, all so, Marie, what do you think about the, the live side of video uh, over at LinkedIn? You know, I mean, part of me says, well, 
there's already people on so many platforms, right? I mean, Facebook Live and YouTube Live and mm-hmm. uh, all these different options. But now that I think of it, I mean, I would... I don't really like doing Facebook Live because to me, Facebook is my personal stuff. You yep. know, well, it's not the case for every brand, but um, eh, so maybe it's possible we'll look into it. We're not massive LinkedIn users, uh, but uh, I could see the benefit for businesses that want to do live vis- video for sure. Well, especially if they're doing uh, like uh, uh, keynote speaking, TED Talk type of things, uh, different events. That's the exact destination for that. As in, you know, they're not really moving videos of those events regularly in that, but potentially LinkedIn Live could be that. And that would be pretty darn interesting. It would be. Yep. Excellent. Well, we're certainly interested in LinkedIn. If you're if you're listening, we would love to have an invite. You know that we, we would even reference multiple stories about LinkedIn Live if you deemed us so worthy. So uh, we, we know people there. Yeah, we do. We'll we'll we'll, we'll reach out. Anyway, <laughs> from Barry Swartz over at Search Engine Roundtable, uh, here's an update on Google. Media search is overlooked by publishers. Tom, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so uh, Gary Eish. Am I pronouncing that correct, Marie? Yeah. I think, yeah. So Gary Eish, yeah, he did an AMA on Reddit. Mm-hmm. Um, this last was earliest week or, early, or end of last week, and uh, um, one of the – um, questions about there was talking about uh, image search and uh, and that sort of thing. And so he, Gary said twice in his AMA read it here straight from the article. Barry says Google images and video search is often overlooked, but they have a massive potential. And I think yeah, yeah they linked it to it here too. John Mueller um, earlier this month, a couple weeks ago, it says that he had a, said that Google in the, in the this year will have a bigger um, will focus more on on media and images and and. In their search results, so I don't know if this is priming us for some sort of update that could be happening within mm. the within the within the algorithm that, uh, or maybe they're just saying, "Hey, there's a lot of search potential out there. You guys mm. should pay attention more to it." So mm. uh, he brought it up a couple times here in the meeting. So I just wasn't sure. If Marie had some thoughts here about uh, um, the image search and, and that sort of thing for for SEOs. Yeah, I mean, it feels to me like Google is really putting an emphasis on, uh, I think you're right, they're trying to prime us to uh, to pay more attention to our images and our videos, assuming that that's relevant to your, your website. Um, one of the things that we're noticing is um, when we do our site reviews, we look at, you know, how much value are your pages adding to a user uh, as compared to your competitors. And often, you know, video makes a massive difference Mm -hmm. or even having unique images. You know, if everybody's got the same stock images, I mean, we, I can't say that that's directly a ranking factor in Google, but it makes sense to me that as a user, if I'm trying to make a decision, a buying decision or something like that, uh, and you've given me a video with all the pros and cons of you know buying your product, um, I think that it, it, it really could be helpful. Um, and I think that Google is getting better and better at figuring out which pages are truly adding value. Uh, and so... Yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely, we do encourage our clients to do as much video content um, and unique images as they can. Mm-hmm. And it does get overlooked um, whenever people launch their websites that uh, that naming conventions of images and, and the, the also uh, re- regularly forgotten the alt tags themselves. I mean, those things are, are supposed to be basics that you're tying into. On top of that, it's a comp- ADA compliance issue, right? But those things are invaluable for getting just telling Google what these images are about. Sure. So it gets it, it gets ignored. And Marie, did they? I <clears throat> uh, saw one of the, a commenter here on the post. Didn't they like remove that referral within Google Analytics? Wasn't there like an image dot Google? And you're right. Um, and, I, and I don't remember the details. Okay, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Wanna, I, sorry, I did just I just I saw the comment there, and he, the comment says if Google will give us back our traffic, give us our traffic back from image search, then it would have a potential is what the person wrote. And I thought I remember there being something with analytics. So that's a squirrel we can chase after oh, the yeah, show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. yeah. So. Yep. All right. Well, for uh, for those of you uh, who are, are, are contributing into our, our chat stream, as well as those of you who are listening and, re- and uh, getting our newsletter on a regular basis, maybe you want to uh, share some of the information that you come across in the image search space, because it is it is underutilized and it's a great opportunity to leverage for your clients or for your for your own company to do the marketing for. So 
that was a great segue for joining the newsletter on a regular basis. We're sending out uh, good information about our guests, what we talked about, uh, who's upcoming on the show, some all the news items of the day that we cover, as well as a pro tipper once or, once or twice. Uh, so join the, join the newsletter over at edgeoftheweberadio.com. It's right there at the top of the page. Uh, just sign up right there. We won't use your email for anything except sending you uh, digital nuggets of gold. You can also text to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk. You can sign up right there. Don't do it while you're driving. Pull over, pull over now. Especially in Indianapolis where there's so many bloody chuck holes. While you're waiting for the roads to be repaired, why don't you go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. Right. Have you That's seen right. the chuck holes in this place? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, chuck holes have chuck holes. That's right. Oh, I was watching uh, uh, from Fox 69 where Noah works there. The, the reporter was, she's like five foot five. She yeah. stood in the pothole. She was 4'11. No. Yeah. No, there, there was literally one over here that's six foot wide yeah. and a foot down. <laughs> it almost, and you know, my car. It almost swallowed up my car. Yeah. Well, you got to get some new uh, new uh, wheels on that Batmobile there. So. <laughs> it's okay. I've got spikes. Okay. They extend out. Anyway, Marie, you got some chuck holes up in, uh, uh, up in Ottawa? <laughs> um, Chuckle, chuck holes, uh, uh, pot, like, potholes, potholes. Pot I call them chuck holes. We have major potholes. Yeah, I mean, we had a massive snowstorm yesterday, which has filled in most of the potholes. But yeah, <laughs> as, soon, as soon as as soon as the spring hits, it's it's horrible here. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's probably worse than we have. probably probably worse than what we've got. <laughs> but you know, hey, uh, they, 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 it's job security. Those uh, road technicians will get out there real quick, right? Yeah, it's election year, so it is election year. No, we'll get done. <laughs> one of our schools had such terrible, uh, that's, that's, terrible. That's why they were they were out by your your right. school district. Yeah. That's right, right. because the, the assistant principal actually asked. It was a phone message and went out to the entire community. Said, "Please call the mayor's action hotline to repair this." And would you would you know it? They were out with an entire asphalt crew today yeah, patching that up. How's that for digital marketing news? <laughs> Has nothing, yeah, nothing to do, to do with, with it. it. All right, it was well, a temporary redirect from the uh, exactly. The See. See, he's on it now. You got it. Well, follow all the featured t- trending topics over at edgeoftheweberadio.com. Uh, so, but for right now, let's re- let's deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Marie Haynes, owner of Marie Haynes Consulting. All right, so let's introduce our audience to Marie. Marie Haynes is, is completely obsessed with understanding Google's algorithms. Uh, she is a regular speaker at conferences like PubCon and SMX. She's also the owner of her own growing agency called Marie Haynes Consulting. Marie, I can appreciate the, the obsession of, of the Google algorithm updates because there's, there's not enough of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if that's true. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, I think we well, heard a couple of years back that literally they're 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 different tests. They're they're uh, algorithm, their algorithms are being updated around six hundred times a year uh, mm-hmm. as a measure. I mean, that's just scary. The big updates, small updates. But um, tell us your backstory: how you got into digital marketing and how you got into the the obsession of Google uh, algorithm updates. My story is probably a unique one. I uh, I used to be a veterinarian. I was actually uh, one of the veterinarians for our prime minister when Stephen Harper was uh, prime minister of Canada. And uh, I loved my job immensely. But um, in 2008, I hurt my back and uh, my husband bought me a laptop and I learned to create a website. And I made this veterinary website and couldn't figure out how to get anybody to see it. Um, and so I started to learn SEO and, uh, and so I was, my very first question was in the SEO chat forums. I asked a question about keyword density and everyone laughed at me even back then. Oh no. Um, (laughs) I know, right. And, uh, and then over the years I just started to get more and more obsessed. And so in between appointments, um, I would be checking SEO forums and then when Penguin came out, so this was 2012, Mm -hmm. uh, Penguin was, as you know, the algorithm that dealt with unnatural links to a, to a website. I was actually um, pregnant with my, our second child and on bed rest. And um, nobody understood Penguin for, when it first came out. So it was a hobby for me to just try to figure it out. And so I started posting my thoughts on what I thought was happening. 
Um, and then people asked if they could consult with me. And I would say, no, no, I'm, I'm not a marketer. I'm, I'm a vet. Uh, and slowly, bit by bit, I started doing some consulting in the areas where I felt I had knowledge. Um, and then uh, that evolved into doing a lot of site audits, um, a lot of Google penalty removals. And um, just a year and a half ago, I started to hire uh, some people to work with me. And so now we have a team of eight of us who work in the same office. Uh, and we do mostly site reviews. We do link audits. And uh, we have a whole lot of fun uh, just trying to figure out why sites aren't ranking properly. Um, so not your traditional leap into marketing. That's how I got No, there. but it, there is a linkage there. You are treating a whole other set of patients, right? And some of those well, then I think the, I think the diagnostic um, yep. mind. Well, and some of those websites got to be dogs. But I'm bump. I was going to ask before we move on, what, what type of pet did uh, Prime Minister Harper have? So... Um, his wife, Laureen Harper, uh, was very heavily involved in cat rescue. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had several foster cats. Yes. And uh, his daughter, um, I saw her with her hamster at one point. Oh, hamster. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so. Canadian you know, we, hamster. <laughs> we only saw them occasionally, but uh, it was very uh, exciting when it happened. Oh. Yeah, eventually you see the cats with a little fat belly and there's no more hamster. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's a bit morose right there. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Marie, we wanted to talk to you today about Google Quality Raters Guidelines. And for our audience that doesn't know what that is, can you give us a kind of a primer, uh, an introduction to uh, what's out there uh, on the on the guideline side of things? Sure thing. So these guidelines, they're available to anybody to find online. You can just do a search for Google Quality Rater Guidelines, mm -hmm. and it's a massive PDF. It's about 160 pages, just over 160. Um, and what it is, is it initially was a, it, it's a guideline to teach these people called quality raters. Now, quality raters are not the same people as Google's web spam team. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're not going to give you a penalty on your website. They're really there to assess uh, Google's algorithms. And the guidelines give the raters all of these different criteria that they say, you know, if a website has this, it's to be considered low quality. If it has this, it's to be considered high quality. And then the quality raters, they have to, um, they get tasks to do. So they are supposed to manually assess, you know, would you trust this website? Right. Um, or if you do this uh, search, would you, um, you know, do you think that the right sites are, trustworthy sites are at the top of the results? I don't know exactly what the questions are that the raters get, but the whole point is that they're given these questions um, and they're given different uh, test search results, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, what the Google engineers want to see is whether they've accomplished what they try to accomplish. And so what, there's a little bit of debate in the SEO world as to how relevant these guidelines are. When they first came out, you know, a lot of people said, well, there's really nothing that I could practically use to implement on my site. And over the last few years, they've really gotten very specific. Mm -hmm. And there are things in there that, that I can definitely see are tied into the algorithm today. Um, you know, so we try to, I mean, we look at way more things than just quality raters guidelines, uh, but we spend a huge portion of our site reviews actually looking at a site through the eyes of these guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, and one final thing about, you know, their importance is uh, Ben Gomes, who is vice president of search at uh, Google. Mm -hmm. He said in an interview with CNBC that the guidelines don't tell us exactly how Google's algorithms work, but it shows us where they we want them to go. Um, so essentially, if something's in those guidelines, I'm under the assumption that Google wants to be able to measure this algorithmically mm -hmm. or they already are. Um, so we think that they're very important. So it's almost like a uh, the, the the human element, and this is what we're talking about here. Um, they're starting to build valuation around these particular metrics, and then ultimately, the rank brain side of things, the algorithm is going to be able to tr be able to pierce that and have AI take over that type of evaluation. Is that what we're talking about? Well, that's one theory. Uh, I mean, I used to think uh, until Google said, no, this isn't the case at the moment, that um, the main purpose of the quality raters was to actually build a machine learning set. You know, if they could determine <clears throat> right. that 
uh, this particular issue was a sign of low quality, and then they could apply that in many different uh, niches and verticals. Um, you know, they could they could use machine learning to um, to make that expand across you know any website. Um, and then I can't remember if it was Gary Eish or John Mueller, but somebody uh, recently said that no, they're not using hmm. uh, quality rater data in machine learning. Um, it's not to say that they won't in the future. But for now, the main purpose is really to test whether the algorithms are doing what the engineers want it to do. Got it. Got it. So it's like a, a an additional evaluation on said target domains and seeing whether or not it's uh, fleshing out correctly. Exactly, um, yeah. All right. So, so it was a bit of a litmus test. So uh, when did they first release the uh, the guidelines because we knew about quality raters for a while and we had no structure to be able to uh, to to be able to understand what they were evaluating it was this uh, very mysterious uh, group of 10,000 or so people right that were, right. were doing this and every now and then i mean before it was publicly available to all of us uh, there would always be a leaked copy you mm -hmm. know that that would come out and I actually bought a domain name, something about leaked quality raters guidelines or something. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, well, and then I, you know, I was learning and I put links to my own site on, uh, on that page. It got a lot of attention until Google asked me to take it down. So, no. um, <laughs> but, um, but then in 2015, I believe it was, uh, Google said, look, we're just going to make this available to everybody. And if you read the blog post that Google uh, put out on the subject, they said, you know, this is to help webmasters understand what Google looks for in terms of quality on websites. Um, so that, I think, was 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gets updated usually in July most years, mm -hmm. although occasionally there's been an update uh, at another time. Um, you know, and sometimes the updates are very minor. Uh, a couple of years ago, the update really just changed the odd little word. And then this July, they changed like hundreds and hundreds of words. And so what we do when the guidelines change is, we, you know, we look at what's changed in the guidelines and, and think, why did Google change that? You know, what are they trying to assess now right. that they need their raters to assess for them? Yeah, you're kind of reverse engineering all that. <laughs> just, to, that's, just to, that's yeah. I can't believe that it's been four years now. I remember when we were, we were reporting the release of that. That was big news. It was like, yeah. oh my gosh, and it was a trove, like 120 pages. Or uh, how big is this document? It's 160 some oh, at okay. this point. Very yeah. good, very good. Yeah. <clears throat> so they released a new version this past July. So what were some of the changes that you noticed? So the biggest change was uh, they added the word safety of users in a couple of different places. Um, and so what we think is happening is uh, Google is trying to protect people from websites that are misleading. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole section on um, uh, deceptive practices. Uh, so for example, um, if you looked like you were trying to... Um, give information about a product, but sneakily you were actually a lead gen site and you hadn't disclosed that to people. We're seeing tons of sites that were hit uh, with the September 27th update. It wasn't given a name, uh, but this was a really significant update. And every site that we saw, we said, yeah, you know what, this this could apply. Hmm. Um, they have something on the website that, that makes it untrustworthy or um, reputation issues that make them, uh, the business untrustworthy. Oh, so wow. for example, you know, there was a whole bunch of discussion as to whether Google uses information from the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's in the quality raters guidelines that the raters are told that if a, a site has, or if a business has an F rating on the Better Business Bureau, that that's to be a sign of low quality. Hmm. And then people freaked out and said, well, there's no way that Google would use, you know, a third party site to determine their rankings. And what we think is it's not like it's black and white that Google says, ah, you have an F rating, therefore you must rank lowly, uh, lowly, that's not a word, lower. Um, rather, what they're saying is, look, there's all these different signals from across the web that tell us that people don't like your business hmm. and so they don't want to rank it well. Um, and that's actually going back to the whole discussion on DA from Moz right. is you know, as Google's adding these little things into the algorithm, that's outside of links. You know, so you can't measure everything by uh, arbitrary metrics. Mm -hmm. Maybe arbitrary is the wrong word, but um, it, it's hard to measure those things. Uh, so I think I've sort of strayed from no, the original. No, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Keep on going. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the main point is, so that's one of the things, oh, right. You asked me what had changed in, in the guidelines. Um, specifically, I mean, there were other changes as well, but they all seem to relate to uh, trust and authenticity. Um, one of the things that we're seeing just recently is that uh, there was a, a post that Systrix put out uh, just this week showing that a couple of sites saw massive drops on January 31st, hmm. and they were sites that appeared to be other organizations, but they weren't. So, for example, one was um, uh, IRS.com. Hmm. Now, that's not the IRS's website, which is IRS.gov. Right. Um, and so the whole idea is that it's misleading people. You know, people went to that site thinking that they were going to the IRS uh, and discovered that, oh, no, wait, they're just, I don't know what they sell there, but um, it, it was not, it was misleading. Um, so that's the type of thing that we feel was a really, really heavy uh, mm -hmm. change in this year. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that changed um, was more emphasis on the EAT, which I'm sure we can, I can unpack that if you want, of um, specific authors on your website. Uh, there was more wording in the guidelines as to what would consider make you consider an author to be authoritative right. um, to have expertise and trust as well. Yeah, I like to actually unpack that. I want to I want to put a post-it note on the trust side of things because I've got a couple 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 questions in that space. But let's go into EAT. Uh, you say it's an important part of the Google Quality Raters guidelines. All right, share with our audience what EAT is all about. For sure. So for some people, EAT is like, it, it almost seems like a buzz phrase that we just made up to have something else to measure in SEO. Um, I'll <laughs> tell you, I mean, I've been studying EAT since early 2017. And uh, now I might have some confirmation bias where, uh, you know, something, Google will say something and I'll say, ah, that supports my theory. But I, I really don't think I'm wrong on this. So EAT stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trust. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, I mean, if you were just diagnosed with cancer, let's say, and you're trying to find articles on this particular type of cancer, would you prefer to read an article by somebody who's a content writer for a medical site or by somebody who's actually treated these cases for 20 years, um, is known as the leading expert in these cases, mm -hmm. uh, has written books on these cases. I mean, obviously that second person is going to be the person that people want to read from in most cases. Right. Um, and so in February of 2017, it was February 7th, there was a massive algorithm update that again, we didn't give it a name. Um, but I started to get requests from people saying like, look, our traffic was decimated on this day. For a lot of people, it was worse than when the Penguin algorithm first came out. And I noticed in every, every single case, it was a site that wrote about um, a YMYL topic. So that stands for your money or your life. Yep. So it was like a medical site, a legal site, a financial site uh, that didn't have expert writers. And when we looked at who was actually ranking for the terms that they had lost rankings for, they were all really well-known authoritative sites. Um, you know, and so that was my theory at that time was that somehow Google was measuring this EAT. Um, and it's in the Quality Raiders Guidelines. Uh, this current version, it's in there 186 times. They wow. mentioned EAT. I mean, it's, it's there all over the place. <laughs> it's there yeah. with authority. And, <laughs> it, yeah, exactly, right? And <laughs> see people... People get stuck on the E, you know, I, I see people saying, well, I'm a doctor and I've written these posts and I can't rank for anything, um, but it's not enough to just, you know, have E, you have to have the AT as well. Mm -hmm. So authority um, really, in my opinion, is mostly tied to links. Mm -hmm. um, I think Google can use mentions in authoritative places as well. That's been supported by uh, Gary Ish has said that a few times. Um, but authority means, is that doctor recognized by experts in the field as an expert? Um, or, you know, it's not enough to just say myself, well, I've been doing this forever. I should be an authority. If other people don't recognize you as an authority, it's going to be hard to rank. Yep. And then the whole T thing, like we just talked about some of the, uh, trust issues that Google could measure, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that was a big factor in the August 1st update and also September 27th, like I said. Right, right, right. So uh, there uh, in the beginning of August, right, was a, a very strong update. Uh, the uh, money, your money, your life and the medical community, all these, uh, 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 these, these, uh, not galleries, but the, um, uh, what am I trying to say? 
there's a massive amount of duplicate con duplicated content out there as well from the glossary side of things. But what you're really saying here is that that all of these sites that had a level of, of presumed expertise, it really kind of cleared the decks and it was looking at the individuals that were contributing in there. And if you if they didn't have these these experts uh, in that space, uh, what was keeping a lot of those sites afloat with just a massive amount of uh, technical content, really kind of mm -hmm. you know, they, they burst their bubble, so to speak, right? Yeah, I mean, in the past, let's say, um, so I know very little about cryptocurrency, but mm -hmm. let's say I, I was taking an interest in it. Um, I have good SEO skills, so I could decide to create a website on cryptocurrencies, um, which obviously is a very competitive space. Mm -hmm. But in the past, <clears throat> if I had enough know-how to even pay for links in the right place, yep. I'm not saying that we should be paying for links, but in the past, I could make that site rank, even though, you know, I just did some research. I'm not the expert. Um, and now that's not so much the case. I mean, there still are people that can take mediocre content or content that's not the best of the web right. and rank it well by pointing good links at it. Um, but in those types of areas, if you do not have the expertise to talk about this, then you're probably not going to rank well. And that's a, that's a really big change for SEOs. Um, because now I, you can't come to me with a, you know, a mediocre website and pay me tons of money to rank it well if you don't have EAT. It's just not going to happen. No, 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 no. Um, it, it's, that's invaluable information. And it really does come back around to this trust aspect and the subjectivity <clears throat> of trust. Now, we've known that uh, there's been a large push of authentic uh, content against fake news. That was a huge explosion of fake news during the, the 2016 uh, election. And that begat uh, a whole other pursuit of evaluating the content on its merits, right? And mm -hmm. expertise and author authoritativeness is, is certainly these, these measurable factors. But there is this subjectivity. And when it gets down to it... Um, Trusting the the AI, trusting the algorithm, right, to to be able to know, you know, who's an expert and who's not, but also you know, these nebulous factors of of how how these experts both compete, and then at the at what point in time does the algorithm choose one oppose uh, as opposed to the other? Boy, that's a that's a tough line, and it's it, tough, right? And and it's, and it's it, go ahead. So, sorry, um, especially if they're not using machine learning in this area, then right. you start looking at, you know, programmatically, how could you determine who to trust? So we as a team, you know, we, we sort of think about that. Like, I mean, obviously, we don't have the minds that Google's engineers have, um, but we started thinking, like, how could you algorithmically determine trust? So one thing for a medical site is um, we noticed that the sites that are ranking really well and did well with the medic update mm -hmm. are ones that uh, tend to reference every one of their scientific um, Citations. statements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you say, you know, such and such has been shown to prove uh, to cure cancer, well, then link to the uh, research articles that support that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we noticed with, um, I mean, we've had hundreds of sites come to us that were uh, negatively affected by this August 1st update. And they weren't all medical sites, um, but they were all YMYL, yeah. uh, very important to people. And, um, you know, we, we saw a ton of sites that had very bad medical advice, um, just things where it was ranking well because I don't know why, you know, because of links or uh, a lot of them were using tricks and loopholes to try to rank. Um, but they had sites that really contradicted uh, actual science. Hmm. So I think that could be measured algorithmically, you know, like if, if um, it's easy to determine whether a site is actually citing sources. Sure. And so if I have a site about diabetes, for example, um, Google knows, you know, everybody who's writing about diabetes tends to reference these particular medical articles. And yep. if you're trying to write about diabetes and you haven't referenced any of those um, research studies, then you're probably not, uh, you know, a trustworthy mm -hmm. source. So, like, I do think that there are things that can be algorithmically measured, but I also think that we're really early in Google's assessment of trust. Mm -hmm. We've seen a couple of sites where we feel like they've gotten it wrong. Um, not that many, though. Most of them that were hit, we can see exactly why they were hit. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it's very hard to turn that around. 
Hmm. So yeah, it's it's tricky. It, it is tricky, and and you know, there is a whole uh, manner of conversation or, or thought in the space of of Google's judgment call on on what's what's real, what's fake, but more importantly, which which news is better news? Because now outside of the medical site, which is very, I agree with you, very program, programmatically evident, right? Uh, and you've got def- definable uh, um, references to be able to compare one side against another. There's a whole nother conversation in, in the news section, and there has been a sizable argument about Google leaning one way in, in what news should actually be ranking and, and what we know as SEOs uh, on certain articles that should be ranking, especially from explicit characters. And all of a sudden, those, those, those articles are not making it up uh, to, to even the top 20. So now we have another factor here is that Google is supposed to be telling us, trust us, we can actually uh, uh, confirm uh, expertise and authority. But then you have this news issue that is pretty stilted and, and, and it, from a lot of perspectives. So, boy, that's a little bit uh, duplicitous, don't you think? Yeah, there's an interesting story that came out this week. I don't know if you saw it about how YouTube is changing how they recommend uh, videos after the one that you're watching. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're apparently going to try now to no longer recommend videos that support cons- uh, conspiracy theories. Right. right. So that's, you know, how do they do how, that? Like, how, <laughs> how, how do, do they, they judge know? a conspiracy? Yeah. How do they know that I'm not wrong about that you know um or that i'm not right about it so right. you know they've, they've and obviously i mean if they have the technology to do that in youtube well they they can determine mm-hmm. things in search that's what the owl update was about mm-hmm. um it was a couple of years ago now right was uh uh trying to fix this whole fake news problem um and i don't think they'll ever have it a hundred percent uh but we did see we saw sites uh one of the sites that dropped with this owl update um was they had loads of stuff on their site about the zombie apocalypse right. uh, and how to prepare for it. And it like writing as if it was a known event that was going to happen. What do you mean now, it's not? It well, is, isn't it? Who knows? I'm See? saying we're no, prepping. Like, no, for real. Like, I read an article today <laughs> that uh, there's some disease in deers that could be transmitted into humans, well, and it could go. be, it's, they, they're calling it the zombie disease. Like, for real. Oh, it's probably like a <laughs> I saw it on a legitimate website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See there. <laughs> but how do you judge that to be legitimate, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, keep, keep I'm on being going. serious. I'm, Normally, I'm, I'm the jokester, but I saw that article. Holy crap. <laughs> well, this particular site, though, that was our theory. You know, everything else on the site was pretty sound. It was technically sound, and it dropped on this particular date where Google said, hey, we're going after fake news. So we had them um, no index all of their posts about zombies. Okay. And, uh, I mean, they did some other stuff, too, but they saw massive improvements um, with a future quality update. Now, that's always tricky, right? Because who knows? Maybe Google just changed the criteria that they were using to to demote that site. Um, but somehow they are working on figuring out what is true and what is not, which is kind of scary, right? Because who is Google to determine what my truth is? Right. Um, but as marketers, that's it's it's a it's something we have to pay attention to. I mean, we can argue day and night that Google's wrong about this, mm-hmm. but that's not going to change our rankings. <laughs> but but it also really takes some of the, the the adjustments and the management out of the control of the marketers because you working on behalf of a medical website, there's no way that you can create more authoritative um, references or expertise for your clients. Now now yeah, you can follow the link path and you can actually get the citations moving, but you can't make that person or that doctor have a larger ex- expertise if they're not willing to contribute yeah. into the spaces that that were that were seen as being judged as valuable, yeah. right? And and that's the thing. I mean, uh, whenever I talk about this at conferences, there's always somebody who comes up to me afterwards and says, "Look, we we provide content to medical sites." And our authors, our content writers, you know, how can we improve that? And and that is tricky, right? I, mm. So one of my suggestions was, and it, for anybody who's in that same boat, you know, if you have an agency where you're providing content to people, start looking for people who truly do have EAT in your area mm. and pay them a whole heck of a lot of money to write. I mean, when <laughs> I <laughs> and and then charge more for that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, thing is you need to have those so let's again I mean I'm talking medical content just because it's the easiest to discuss but sure. uh, if you do get a doctor who says yeah you know I'll write 
a couple articles a month on on your topic, you need to make them associated with your website. Um, and so we recommend, and we don't know how Google algorithmically determines this, but we recommend things like, um, you know, making sure the doctor has a LinkedIn page and that uh, they mention on their LinkedIn page that they're connected with your website. Mm -hmm. um, and also helping that doctor get their own authoritative mentions. Um, so helping the doctor get uh, quoted in medical journals or it, mm -hmm. well, journals would be a hard one for the SEO to, to do, but in um, medical publications, you know. Uh, and so there are things you can do to improve EAT. They really um, uh, cross the line into PR, basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, improving um, the, the brand awareness of that individual can help towards EAT. But it's not like the old days, again, where you could, if you got some really good links, you could fix everything <laughs> almost. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, I wouldn't say that EAT can't be improved because mm. I, we, we've seen it. Like we've seen other things like we recommend doing all you can on your website to speak to your EAT. Um, you know, making sure every author has a whole page that discusses why they're qualified to write about this topic. Um, but it takes a lot of work to do that. Uh, and it's tricky too, because, you know, we're just going on our assumptions, which really is SEO, right? Is yeah. there's a lot of things where we get a theory, we say, okay, let's try this. And then we see if it helps. Um, hmm. But yeah, EAT definitely can be improved, but it's not easy. Oh, that is tough. That's tough. And it really it moves us out of the uh, what conventional SEO has all been about because we, we, we knew our sandbox. We knew all the different things, especially looking through the guidelines, the Raiders guidelines. We could evaluate and make changes, right? Now, this is, this is foreign territory because we're truly trying to move the people that we're trying to market to do their job better. <laughs> for lack of a better description. Yeah. And if you have a business that has a horrible reputation online, I mean, that's yeah. all throughout the quality raters guidelines. Uh, as an SEO, you can't fix that. No. You know, there are business practices that need to change. Um, but you can advise on, look, this, we feel that this reputation issue is holding you back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we see mm -hmm. that, we say, when you get uh, complaints online, respond to every one of those complaints. That's actually something that's one of the BBB's uh, ranking factors is whether or not your complaints have been responded to. Um, and respond in a way that shows that you're actually working to fix the problem. And then even better is collect, you know, here's the common complaints that we have now as a business. How can we fix our business? Um, so that, you know, it, the job of an SEO is now going well beyond technical aspects yep. um, and into actual business advice, which, so I, I really think that the whole um, field of SEO is changing dramatically as, uh, as Google is moving beyond just zeros and ones in the algorithm um, and being able to measure things that we thought before were not measurable. Right, right. No, we, we, we now are charged with holding up the mirror to our clients and going, you know what, you just, you can't, you can't game this. And there's only so much that we can do to to polish this up. If you're exactly. not, if you're if you're leaving a wake behind of bad business business practices, um, I mean, obviously, if you improve it, it's going to improve your customer service. It's going to improve everything that you do as a company. But what a great reflection that we're now seeing. But boy, it's it's tough to put all of the all of the trust into the, the Google measurements. Uh, mm -hmm. th th there's always something that you want to be able to hold back. And, and uh, from the authoritativeness and expertise, that's a slippery slope of judgment calls that Google's making. Yeah, and I mean, I would love to know what uh, the algorithms look like mm -hmm. that are, are working on these things. But what we do know is that, I mean, number one, uh, Google's told us that the quality raters guidelines reflect what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, number two, the guidelines tell us, you know, all these things about how to improve, whether you call it EAT or just, you know, how your brand is represented, how people trust you, how they recognize you. Um, and so I don't think that those are sort of out there theories like this is this is important stuff. Yeah. Um, but it is a big step up for uh, a lot of people who have been doing SEO for years um, and want practical things that we can measure. Uh, you know, somebody asked me in a, a recent webinar I did on EAT. Well, how do I measure whether my EAT improvements are actually being recognized? And, you know, that's a tough thing. We, we talked about maybe creating some sort of a metric almost similar to what Moz does with yeah. DA. Uh, but the problem is, like, we have no idea, other than what's in the quality raters guidelines, how they're algorithmically measuring this. So it would just be a guess. Yeah. Um, so 
the point is, I mean, the stuff that's in the quality raters guidelines, it's, it's good for business all around. Uh, so even if we're not exactly improving rankings, um, some of the stuff can improve conversions. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one of our recommendations is always to display your EAT related stuff on your homepage above the fold. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like, let's say you're, um, uh, an attorney, um, have something above the fold that says, and I, I don't know what you're legally allowed to say, uh, but something that says, you know, we're recognized as uh, our city's number one um, legal firm. We've had this many, we've won this many awards. We've won this much money for our clients. You know, like say stuff that basically boasts about here's why you want to trust us. Mm -hmm. And even if that doesn't translate into better rankings, it should help with conversions that if people can trust you more then more people are going to use your site. And who knows? I mean, maybe that's part of, uh, that's one of my theories too, that um, Google uses information from Chrome to determine, you know, which sites are people actually interacting with because you tend to trust the sites that you interact with. Um, oh, so, yeah. yeah. We're, we're giving them loads of data, not only from uh, Google uh, Google Analytics, but the Chrome uh, browser, which is a fantastic browser, is, is certainly piping data back to Google oh, sure. in, in yeah. so many different ways. Um, quickly, uh, in respect for time, I did, we did want to unpack one more area. Uh, and EAT certainly deserves a heck of a lot more expansion, and we're certainly going to put all the show notes uh, in and links to uh, your content where, where our, our listeners can, can consume it. Eh? Uh, uh, at their own leisure. I'm full of dad jokes today. Um, but we want to jump into disavows. Uh, we've, you've spent a lot of time uh, recently discussing the value of the disavow tool. Can you go over the history of this tool and where it stands now? Sure. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So um, as I said before, I mean, when Penguin first came out, so that was 2012, mm -hmm. April of 2012. And we eventually figured out what Google told us, that it was primarily about link quality. Um, and what Google was trying to do is eliminate or reduce the possibility that you could work your way to the top just by building your own links. Because the whole reason why links uh, count in Google's algorithms is that if I link to you, I'm recommending you. Um, whereas, you know, if you create your own links and your own recommendations, why should Google count those? It, it doesn't really mean that you're a better website. Um, and so in 2013, uh, Google came out with the, um, or actually, no, sorry, it was late 2012, came out with a disavow tool. Uh, and they said, um, you know, if you have these links that you feel Google's algorithms are um, distrusting, then you can put them in, it's just basically a text file, and you upload the text file to Search Console. And uh, then if Google comes across these uh, links that are in your text file, they will no longer count those links in their algorithms um, as, you know, pointing to your site. And so um, we found that we were able to get some sites partially recovered from penguin hits by using the disavow tool. Yep. Then in uh, 2016, um, in September, when uh, Google came out with Penguin 4.0, and most of you guys probably remember that because it was almost two years that we had been waiting for a penguin update. That's right. And, if you were, you know, and penguin back then would suppress a site. And so if you were... Um, you would basically be penalized. You know, you didn't get a penalty in Search Console, but uh, rankings would be suppressed. And, and there was no way to get out of that until Google reran Penguin. So when Penguin 4.0 came out in 2016, what uh, Gary Ish said um, was that Penguin no longer demotes sites. Instead, they can figure out which links are unnatural and just ignore them, hmm. which is fascinating, right? And so everybody, I'm sure all of the marketers out there were like, yes, I am going to spam the heck out of my links. So uh, if there's no penalty for it, you know, let's just keep doing it and see what works. Um, and then I can just disavow if I seem like I'm not doing well. But <laughs> the thing is, none of that, I didn't really see very many studies of people saying like, oh yeah, I tried all these extra links that were supposed to be unnatural and it helped, you know. I mean, again, there are black hats that still can get away with some of this stuff. But for the most part, like Penguin was doing a really good job at uh, ignoring unnatural links. So then my thought was, well, why are we doing any disavow work anymore? Right. Um, you know, because disavowing, we're asking Google to ignore links that now they're saying they're already ignoring. Mm. So that doesn't make sense. And also to do a proper link audit and disavow, you really should hire somebody with experience and that's expensive. So, you know, why spend thousands of dollars on something that 
is useless. Um, and so every time we asked a Google employee about this, they would come up with this sort of PR answer that said, like, well, if it makes you feel better, like, go ahead and disavow. There's no harm. You know, and, and, and I'm saying, well, it, there is harm because it's Cost of us money. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive, right? Um, and so uh, just recently, um, I was able to go to New York City to the Google offices and be a part of a help hangout with John Mueller, which was awesome to meet John and, and uh, um, be a part of that. And so I asked him again, uh, you know, if he could give us some more clarification. And I specifically said, can unnatural links hurt your site algorithmically? Because we still know, I mean, manual actions are out there. There aren't as many these days, but, um, but algorithmically, you know, should we still be disavowing? And um, John basically said, well, he actually, to quote him, he said, that's definitely the case. Um, that, you know, that I know that's funny, right? Because often he'll say it depends, but <laughs> he was very clear in saying that there still is a place for using the disavow tool, um, even if you don't have a manual action. Mm -hmm. So there's two reasons for that. One is to prevent a manual action. So if you have the types of links that you would be really worried about the web spam team seeing, like you've been paying for links, you've been doing large scale article marketing, um, especially with keyword anchors, mm -hmm. then um, you should disavow just so that you don't get a manual action. Because trust me, you know, a lot of manual actions can just devastate a site and often you can't recover. Amen. Okay. Um, so, but then algorithmically, there are algorithms outside of Penguin. And what John said was what they do is if they determine that they can't trust some of the links pointing to your site, then they put less trust in all of your links. So that's interesting, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the, the big take home point here, though, is that most sites still do not need to disavow. So if you look at your links and you see like all these spammy uh, links from spammy image sites. Yeah, and we call like, them like barnacles on the hull of the ship that keep you. Yeah, keep yeah, just up. cropped. Yeah, that every site gets. Yep. Those are the links that Google's algorithms are ignoring um, and they're not going to hurt you. But. If you've got a ton of links that were made for SEO purposes and there's not a lot of value outside of SEO, mm -hmm. um, so I'm talking about PBNs or, again, article marketing on sites that no person's ever going to read, yep. you're never going to get a conversion from those, you're just doing it for the link, then we've started in the last, uh, I think we started about eight months ago or so, um, actually, even before we had this information from John, um, starting doing some more disavows again. And we're actually seeing some of these sites see massive improvements, like mm. really good improvements. Um, not every site. Uh, so we're, we're going to start, you know, doing more of that now, now that we have the confirmation that, um, you know, there is good reason to do it. I don't think everybody should run out and be disavowing, but um, I'm really excited to see the next few months when we um, file quite a few more disavows and see if we can get some case studies to actually show that it's working. Um, that's wonderful information. And thank you for sharing um, uh, that. And it, it's very insightful. And um, it's, it's, it's good affirmation uh, from John Mueller as well. Um, my question is, one last question in this space is, um, there's a school of thought that the disavow process is still adding into the the, the database of, of bad links that you're trying to contribute and, and share. And Google's certainly benefiting from that continued uh, conveyor belt of, of disavows. Um, you know, it, it, would it be fair to say that uh, it's, it's a kind of a dialogue that you're having with Google? And um, it's not to, to say that you're trying to get out of a penalty box, but you're just kind of keeping your hole clean. And the benefit is to Google's, to Google that they're seeing, yeah, you know, there's inventorying regularly bad sites, and you know they're certainly going to scrutinize them. But having that continued conversation uh, with the disavow tool is, is that some has that been discussed in your team of, of something of a benefit? Uh, do you mean are are you concerned that if you file a disavow, you're going to do harm because you're alerting no, Google to the fact? Or I, I'm saying not, that just having a conversation, and, and that is a way of having a conversation with Google, that it's just another data point that you're giving regularly to Google, uh, being being a square, you know, st straight line company. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was some discussion uh, for a while as to whether Google was using all the information that we gave them. You know, so if we filed a disavow, right. uh, 
and then uh, I listed your website in my disavow file, could that harm your website? You know, if enough people disavowed your website and Google has adamantly denied that they use that kind of information. And I, I believe them. Um, and the reason for that is so I have a, a blacklist, a disavow blacklist that uh, if there's a site I come across where I'm like, oh yeah, I would never want to have a link from this site. I'm always going to disavow it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I trust my own judgments in that list. When I first created that blacklist, what I would do is actually put in other people's disavow files because I review a lot of disavow files um, and I get them from tons of people. And what I found was that people are really bad at disavowing. Um, and so there was a tool that uh, I think remove, it was one of the penalties that, or one of the companies that did penalty um, software. Uh, they had this tool where you could upload your disavow file and then they would say, hey, the most commonly disavowed uh, links across the web are these sites. And one of the top sites that uh, was disavowed often was Google.com. No. Um, you know, like, well, people don't know the right links to disavow. <laughs> Um, so I think if Google just blindly took everybody's disavow file and used that data for something, mm. it would be so flawed, uh, you know, cause people disavow goods. I've seen people disavow their own site by mistake. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> it's awful. Can you, can you share quickly how, how you evaluate a, a website, whether it, it would be on your disavow list or not? So, I mean, sure. we talked about earlier about how you just can't rely solely on domain authority for that. I, I, I like to use what I just call the credit card test, what I feel comfortable giving them my credit card number. Um, but how, how do you evaluate a, a website for a disavow or non-disavow? Sure. So something that John Mueller said recently was that if a tool can tell you which links to disavow, then Google's probably already ignoring them, um, which was very interesting. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, there are certain links that, again, if they're in my blacklist, if they're like low quality directory sites, you know, free PR link directory dot com, yeah. pretty obvious we're going to disavow those. But I actually <laughs> think Google's ignoring those. Yeah. Um, and so what I look at is I don't use metrics like domain authority or uh, even like whether the site has a security certificate or whether I would give them my credit card. Um, I look at, was this link made with the intention of manipulating rankings? Mm. And people would argue, well, that's SEO, right? I mean, we make links. Why do we build links? It's so that we can get better rankings. But if it's really obvious that, um, again, like article marketing is one of the big things now, um, and guest posting that is just overdone. Uh, so I'll, I have a whole bunch of criteria that um, we've got a big list that my team and I go through. Um, I think I'm soon going to be, I, I published a book years ago on my process for removing penalties. I'll probably do the same thing now for link audits because it's changed over the years. Oh, cool. Uh, but a lot, of it, a lot of it is just um, from over the years of uh, when Google gave us um, manual actions, they would give us examples of links that they were considering unnatural. So I have a massive list of, of hmm. those. Uh, and I can say like, oh, you know, Google gave us this exact type of link as an example of an unnatural link. So I know it doesn't, it's not a great answer to your question because I can't sure. say, look, if a link falls under these criteria, you must disavow yeah. it. It's, it's different for every site and it really depends on patterns as well. Yep. Um, yeah. you know, if you've got a keyword anchored link from, uh, you know, some high authority site, I'm not going to disavow that. But if that same keyword anchored link appears in uh, 50 different articles that all seem very similar and smell like SEO to me, then I'm probably going to recommend disavowing those. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes yeah. sense. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for un unpacking that. That's, a, that's great information. And we are huge champions. Yes, please write that book. Right. <laughs> it's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> <Big> list. <laughs> uh, we're going to hold you to it. We're going to get you back on the show whenever we, so we can unpack that. Hey, um, uh, we, we always like to finish up our, our conversations, and we appreciate your time today uh, with a couple of questions. What bugs you right now about your industry? What bugs me about the industry? I think that's a hard question to answer because misinformation bugs me, mm -hmm. but it also bugs me that it's hard to share information. So let me unpack that. Um, if I have a theory about something, like for example, EAT, I've taken a, a lot of flack on, you know, I, I publish something and then I'll get subtweeted from people saying, oh, you know, that can't be true because blah, blah, blah. And so people become afraid to put out their theories, huh. right? Um, for fear of people making fun of them. Um, and there are very few people in this industry that have 
fantastic knowledge in every area. You know, we're all just trying to figure it out. Um, and so I think on one hand, I would love to see people publishing more of their theories and thoughts. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I would like that people make it clear that it's theories and thoughts. Um, so if I publish a theory, I'll very clearly say, I don't have proof for this, but this is what I think. And here's why I think it's happening. Sure. Um, as opposed to like, this is what's happening. Um, yeah. I got, you know, I, I highly agree with you. And, and then we're a bit gun shy just because of the, the, the trolling that happens after, but we also are gun shy because everybody's got a top 10 list. Everybody's got a solution. And, and, I mean, there's a, there's a, a glut of, of, I mean, over the course of the last five years, just that was part of the wake of being an authority is they got to keep on throwing that stuff out there. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the theory side of it because that gets the conversation going again. Exactly. But yes. people have to yeah. be a little bit more brave, especially in this social media realm we're in. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, well, conversely, uh, what excites you about your industry right now? Oh, I think there's so much opportunity for um, for growth in SEO. Um, I see so many marketing agencies that are stuck in old practices. Oh. Uh, I we we still see people coming to us that um, I, I have a a friend of mine who years ago I built a website for him and I was charging him like a hundred bucks a month just to um, to uh, to be there for SEO questions. And um, just recently he left and he said, "Oh, you know, we're gonna go with this other company." and uh, spent them thousands of dollars. And then he just came back and said, they have no clue what they're doing. Oh, wow. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, doing directory submissions like it was 2010, oh. Oh. You know, like earlier. And, and that's out there, you know. And so if you are truly able to rank websites, mm -hmm. um, if you're truly able to help websites do better, there's so much opportunity. You know, if, if you're not just hiding behind tricks and loopholes uh, and you can actually succeed, then there's a lot of opportunity in this industry. No, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think more and more companies are armed with knowledge of what to look for in an agency. Uh, unfortunately, they've been kind of baptized by fire and they've gone through a number of iterations of companies that just never did help them. But um, you got much more savviness in, in the marketplace. And uh, you know, there's a level of quality that needs to happen and, and is happening now with SEOs that know what they're doing and the, the wheat is separating from the chaff, so to speak. And man, there's a, there's, there's a lot to do if you're a good SEO, right? Yeah. 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 Well, you certainly are a good SEO, uh, Marie. We appreciate your time and your contribution into this industry. Uh, please, uh, please keep on being uh, that, that, <laughs> that champion of, of best quality and, uh, uh Keep your theories out there. Don't be gun shy. Keep on contributing because uh, we're listening. Trust us. Um, uh, we certainly want to promote you. And uh, is there something that you'd like to promote uh, on the show to wrap up? Sure thing. Um, I have a newsletter as well that we put out uh, every week mm -hmm. with the latest news on SEO. So mm -hmm. you can find that at mariehaines.com slash newsletter. Okay. Um, yeah, if you're, I mean, we have a bit of a waiting list for site reviews, but, uh, if you want to reach my team and I at help at mariehaines.com, um, we can fill you in on our waiting list and our, uh, site reviews because, uh, we do really good work. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you again for your time today, Marie. We're certainly going to put all this information in the show notes and, uh, we will, uh, we'll speak, uh, loud and wide as much as we can, uh, letting let, uh, our listeners know that they need to pay awesome. attention to what you guys are doing up there. So, uh, thanks for uh, calling in from Canada and uh, stay safe. Uh, don't get buried in snow up there. All right. And don't fall into a pothole. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, these <laughs> things are craters. All right. Well, thanks for listening to Edge of the Web Radio. Again, we certainly appreciate our listeners and our audience uh, contributing uh, in, into the space. Feel free to jump on to our live stream on a regular basis and, and uh, give us some questions to ask our, our, uh, our, our guests that are coming up. Um, so certainly... Uh, Want to have you over to edgeofthewebradio.com and check out what we're doing. Uh, in fact, who are we going to be talking to next week, Tom? We have an old pal back on the show, Aaron. Aaron Robbins is coming back on. No! And she's going to be in studio, she said. so. She's going to be in studio? She said she's she going to try to be here, so we'll see. How did I not know about this? Holy crap. Mm -hmm. We got we to gotta give Doug Carr a jingle, too. Uh, maybe. We oh, have a throwback show. The, the bourbon may actually flow next week. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea she was coming. Fantastic. 
All right. So from all of us over at Site Strategics and, and Edge of the Web, thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, uh, review, and give us some thumbs up when you can. Share our, our content because I, I think we're talking to some fantastic people on a regular basis. And we're trying to tell, tell the truth out there and separate fact from fiction. So from all of us over at Edge of the Web, thanks so much. And we'll talk to you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye.